So yeah, now for something completely different. Um, I am a composer of music and I use the computer to sort of augment my compositional practice. So today I thought I would like talk and this is in order of length of slides. Um, I'm working on a book. Uh, I recently gave a keynote, well, not that recently, but it's COVID times, um, an installation using uh, spatial computing and then a concerto that I'm working on that has a fractal organizational structure. So the first thing that I'm doing is a book called Believe by Making. And this is gonna be co-authored with Phoenix Perry. It's gonna be huh, next year, not this year anymore. Um, <laughs> and basically it's a book with an associated website slash GitHub repository on the history of video game controllers and then the philosophy of embodied cognition. So our brains are not software that exists independently from the hardware of our bodies. The shape of our hand impacts how we think. Um, it's a really cool philosophy that is important to me because I study a lot with gesture. Um, and the idea here is that we'll talk about, you know, the data glove, and then you can build your own data glove for $5 worth of parts. And hopefully we will keep the website updated so that as, you know, chips become available or not, we'll keep the website updated. And then the book can stand alone with the history and the philosophy that don't sort of change as rapidly as the technology. Um, and we're sort of organizing it from these ever widening spheres. So starting with the hand, which a lot of embodied cognition people do, moving up to the arm, then how do you move in space? And finally ending with the environment. So you end up building a site specific video game that has your hand controller, your thing that moves like motors that move your hand for itself. And it's gonna be cool. I'm excited about it. Questions on that? <laughs> yeah. What's in, the, what's in the GitHub report? That's all the um, code to actually download and teach you how to program these things. Okay. Yeah. So we're gonna also have sort of um, easy machine learning for posture detection for the hand kind of stuff so that you don't have to program, you know, all the algorithms yourself, but you can sort of speed up that process to get useful data quickly. Okay, um, the next project is um, something that I'm excited to work on here at IACS, which is collapsing the infinite and finite. So um, again, I'm using um, Jupyter Notebooks. And what I really want to do, and we haven't gotten this working yet, is um, to have live code on the web where people can actually run it themselves without having to download all the libraries. Um, it's, it's a security risk, but it should be possible. <laughs> Um, I'm using Julia. How many people know Julia? Cool. Yay. Um, I'm excited about this. And then um, what I really want to do for IACS for my core teaching here is to develop a course on filters, but approach it from an engineering, like electrical engineering with circuit diagrams, programming the computer code, and also having dials so that the audio people can hear it. And then hopefully all three perspectives will gain an understanding and appreciation for how the other people do it. Um, and the title for that quote came from a Fourier, which was that mathematics compares the secret and most diverse phenomenon and then discovers the secret analogies that unite them. This is some Julia code. Um, and what I did was basically show the old way of doing things and this new way, which is a block co-save overlap. Um, FFT based block convolution. Basically, if you do things accurately enough, it's really inefficient, but you can get really interesting results. So right now in audio, there's sort of these two kinds of filters, finite impulse response filters and infinite impulse response filters, but we can collapse them into the same dimension, basically, by doing this block co-save um, convolution. Um, not only will this let us do new sounds, the other thing that I'm really excited about is it's going to make wave field synthesis a lot more approachable. So wave field synthesis, you have a huge array of little speakers and you basically make a holographic image of the sound. So usually to get immersive audio, you have to have a lot of speakers surrounding you. It's a pain in the ass to set it up, cable, all that stuff. Instead, you just bring in a row of speakers stick it one place and you still can get immersive audio. It's not great for low frequencies, but we don't really have dimensionality for low frequencies anyway. So big row of speakers, subwoofer, good to go. Excitement. Questions on that?
Is it coming? Yeah, in the back. Um, so you're talking about filters here. So they're filtering the, the electrical waves that you're getting from sound. Out. Yep. So this would be like a low pass filter. That yep, exactly. Yep. And that was the first example that I do. I say, here we do a low pass filter in the old method and the new method. And then we actually, I listed the numbers and subtracted them and showed that it was essentially the same. Yeah. Is it, is, does this have any relation with spatial audio as like sort of like Dolby Atmos and DTS? Um, so Atmos, again, is a lot of speakers. Um, and the wave field synthesis is like oh, Atmos is there, sort of the speakers are surrounding you. Um, and it's more ambisonics related to get the um, mapping to different um, size rooms and different speaker placements. And then the wave field is just a, a single row. But yeah, the immersive audio experience that you may have had at your Dolby Atmos theater nearest you. <laughs> And also, um, Apple is getting into the immersive audio game as well with their spatialization in the headphones. So it's becoming more important, I think, also with like um, VR as well, which I'm bored of. Yeah. The wave field? A little bit, um, but not as much as you think because it's very, very high frequencies that are intersecting, basically. Yeah. Good questions, y'all. All right, um, this is a project that was up across from my office for a while um, during the pandemic, and you could just go to a website and click on it and things would happen in the room, which is why I think we can do this for the Julia code. If we just put a barrier website in between to only let you click on things. Um, it's called Rumline. Um, and a rum line is actually an arc crossing all meridians of longitude at the same angle. So basically if you walk north, only using a compass, you will travel in a spiral. Um, so this appears as a straight line and Mercator projection, but a spiral on a globe. And I thought that was a kind of fun thing. So it's four of us um, and we are emphasizing the undervalued spatial properties of acoustic sound. Again, here we are, spatialized sound and back to embodied cognition, right? The bodies that produce them. Um, so first we did frogs and we're working on um, ultrasonic bats right now. And the cool thing about like ultrasound is you can get difference tones if they're precise enough to very high frequencies vibrating together, give you a low frequency that is audible. Um, and then we're gonna give people the ability to control those frequencies, but we'll also have like a smartphone app that lets you see the frequencies that you cannot hear, which is gonna be fun. So the origin story of this is I grew up in um, New Jersey, there was a stream and the pond at the bottom of the stream would change in size, you know, if there had been rain or not. And I'd come home from this deep listening workshop and it rained overnight. And then I realized that I could tell that the pond was larger the next day, not by looking, but by listening. So I was like, wouldn't it be cool if I could make an installation with a whole bunch of little robot frogs. There are these wooden instruments that are made in the shape of frogs called guiros. Um, and it turns out it's really hard to get this kind of motion, but it's really easy to get this kind of motion. Um, and we just decided that we would use little um, toothpicks, basically. Um, and we are using this thing called a Dada machine, which is really dead simple, but it's turning MIDI into like motor controls. And then um, there's a Max patch that talks to all these little guys and each one of them is different. They have different size bodies, they have different numbers of um, little plectrum. That, and so each one has a unique signature. And the idea is you listen from behind an acoustically transparent curtain to think of what the shape might be. And every day the curator changes the shape of the exhibition. And we made a website because of the coronavirus. And basically it was set up in a room and there were Twitch streams one with no video and then one with video. And then there's this um, little sound man dummy head in the middle of the room with uh, microphones in the ears, which gives you accurate 3D sound. So people on the web could trigger a rhythm and it would evolve using AI and go either clockwise or counterclockwise around the room. And you could turn the head um, and the head was averaged collectively with all the people that were sort of in the try trying to control the head. So that was with an Arduino. And 
So that was all that. So talked about this. Oh, the really, really interesting thing was um, <laughs> the motors on the data machine would burn out. So ports would stop working. Um, the frogs themselves would stop working. Um, they would get bent out of shape or if it was particularly humid, they would also have issues. And we decided to actually make that part of the installation so that we accept the frogs deaths and the port deaths as like the sadness of the amphibians that are also dying. Yeah. Um, and this is a little video. It's a feature, not a bug. It's a feature, not a bug. And that video is not here, but if you're interested, there are videos. Um, so any questions on that? I missed the connection to the drum line. How did the, how did the drum line play into this? That's just the title of the whole uh, project. And then we eat rum line and then we pick a specific species uh, to. It's, it's just art, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so this is uh, the last thing that I'm going to talk about, which is a fractal uh, concerto. So I got asked to write a violin concerto, and I was like, "Ugh." Um, and then I thought, "Well, what's the structure of a concerto? Anyone know? Three movements, fast. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, fast, slow, fast. And so what I thought was to do a fractal, and then I was bored by just having fast, slow, fast. So I added sort of a sigmoid connector between slow and faster. So this is the shape that came out, which is cool. And I call it stepped reckoner, reckoner because of the first mechanical calculator created by Leibniz. Um, and then um, the movements I pulled from this quote in German. Um, so one of the movements is all, one of them is different. So, and then I named sigmoid, sigmoid. Anyway, and basically it says any number consisting of a series of figures, as long as it may be in proportion to the size of the machine, which I liked. Um, so it is self-similar down to seven levels by eight because of sort of logarithmic specificity. It was way too fast. And so what I ended up doing was overlaying two layers of fractals, one that was operating on one scale and one that was operating two thirds of that length. And so it's kind of fun to have those overlapping. Um, here's the fractal, here's the fractal. <laughs> Here's the fractal, right? You can see it. Ooh, animation. All right. And what also then happens is um, because of that organization, there are weird places where suddenly all of them reset um, and those become important moments in the composition. And so there's big ones, there are smaller ones where only one of the proportions comes and restarts, but there's other moments where they're both restarting, which is fun. Um, I'm doing a symmetrical um, stage plot. It's going to be 5.1 sound, but the sound is also going to have height as well as um, left rightness. And then the orchestra is symmetrically distributed. And then they all have these little curtalies. And if I've been thinking, I have curtalies in my car right now and it could have brought you on. It's a little tiny um, metal disc and you strike it and it goes, it's very cute. Um, <laughs> this is the percussion. Um, what is cool about this is I have three bass drums. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and then here, these omglockens, I also um, arranged in a specific order that reference that um, fractal organization. And the first percussionist that was doing this put her her um, omglockens in chromatic order and then was like, I can't play this part with the double stops. I was like, because you did not put it together correctly. I gave you a diagram. Um, so. <laughs> Yep, height addition and panning. Okay, yeah. And then the thing that I'm doing here is I'm analyzing the sound in the percussion to decide what the processing on the violin is gonna be. So it's gonna be this spectral delay, but basically if the percussionist is rolling on a single pitch and the violinist is doing a scale, only that pitch that the percussionist is playing will be reinforced in the electronics. And then there's gonna be a pedal that sort of lets the percussion stack up chords without having to play chords and then reset them, which is going to be cool. And um, this, I write notes. Sometimes my colleagues in music are astonished that I write notes. And this is actually one of the most beautiful things I've ever written. Um, it's all these trills. It's kind of Chopin-esque. Um, you can see these rhythms are all coming from that fractal. And I decide, you know, and do I want to be at the top level, then I move really quickly 
down a couple levels, right? So I'm not, I'm just following my intuition about what I want to use, right? I just pick and choose from those levels. And then you can see in here that the speed of the trill then also, it's not going to be totally precise because it's a human doing this, but in each movement, different things are controlled by that fractal. This is the um, programming language that I use called Max MSP, um, and it's basically um, flowcharts and numbers and spectral delay. And that's it. I play cello, so, so you could actually do two. Yeah, violin is smaller, making it faster. But yeah, some pieces are more difficult than others. This is hard. Yeah. This is not an easy piece. There's but we have um, Juilliard graduates that come here for their doctorates, so and then I give my music to them, and they <laughs> are scared. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, and I have to use a computer, and then and then they end up liking it, and then I'm like, come to the dark side. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, there it's gonna be on a CD. Uh, I actually I have to finish it. Um and uh yeah, I will hopefully finish it this summer, record it. Um uh, there will hopefully be actually a premiere here in the fall, like over in the music department. So, so that will be great. Yeah. Well we we had questions of white draft and we do have the time. Yeah.